Welcome everyone to the 2019 um, Drysdale Lecture and I'm going to ask uh, Dwight to come and introduce our speaker and our topic for this evening. Well, it, it is uh, my honour to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Goddard who is uh, recently retired uh, and now honorary professorial fellow in the uh, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Center for the Study of Islam in the Contemporary World at Edinburgh University. And he has to have a very long business card to get that all on there. But uh, the, uh, Professor uh, Goddard did his undergraduate studies in Oxford and his doctorate at the Center for the Study of Islam and Christian-Muslim Relations in Birmingham, where he went on to uh, the University of Nottingham, where he taught in the Religious Studies Department for some 25 years, uh, before going to Edinburgh some 10 years ago. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, as you might expect, and, and articles, uh, Christians and Muslims, From Double Standards to Mutual Understanding in 1995, Muslim Perceptions of Christianity in 1996, and what is Surely the sort of the go-to book in Christian-Muslim relations is the history of Christian-Muslim relations published in the year 2000. So uh, when uh, we had the opportunity to have him come, I asked him if he would perhaps update uh, the status of Christian-Muslim relations. And so that is what he happily uh, agreed uh, to do. One other uh, thing I want to note before we uh, hand over so he has uh, sufficient time to give his lecture is uh, a word of, of great thanks and appreciation to Professor Goddard because, for a very generous donation of books to uh, the Manchester Center for the Study of Christianity and Islam in the, uh, for the library. <clears throat> and uh, as he was retiring and needing to figure out what to do with his books, as academics tend to have to figure out when you move out of your office. Uh, he allowed us to come. Uh, Phil and I went to his office and were allowed to ruffle through all of his library and bring back uh, a thousand or so volumes of his uh, And so those are, are now cataloged and available for checking out in the library. And you can see that. And uh, Helen has very kindly set up a table there with some examples of the, uh, the collection as well as some of, of um, his own books. So have a look at those uh, afterwards in the refreshment time following the, uh, the lecture. So we thank you, for, want to express publicly and uh, loudly our thanks for your generosity in that and for accepting our invitation to come and give this lecture day. So, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor and Dwight, for your very kind words. Uh, and it's very nice to be here in Didsbury at the Nazarene Theological College, particularly in the light of that uh, association. And uh, uh, as Dwight said, it is always a bit of a dilemma when you get to retirement and you've spent a lifetime building up a book collection, what are you going to do with it? And a particular issue for me in Edinburgh, where we live on the top floor of uh, an Edinburgh house, is the floor probably won't cope with the weight of the books if I attempted to move them there. And, uh, for that reason, it was a very great pleasure to find such a good home uh, in the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Islam here in Manchester. It's a new venture, building up the study of the subject, and I'm really pleased that my collection has been able to be of assistance here. So, uh, here's me, the Awa Lead Centre, uh, you know that, and here is the title of uh, our lecture for this evening, The Current State of Christian Muslim relations. Uh, and you might say this is a bit of a tall order. Uh, it's certainly challenging, but uh, in three quarters of an hour's time, all being well, you will have the opportunity to comment and judge on my uh, assessment. 
Uh, and here is the overview of the lecture. This is what was put onto the little flyer that I know has been circulated. Uh, putting it into context, the 14th century relationship between the Christian and Muslim communities is a long and complex one, many different dimensions. The first two decades of the 21st century have now seen a number of significant new developments, both in what we might call a strictly theological sense, but also in the broader cultural and political senses. So what I'm going to try and do in this lecture is to assess the current state of the relationship between the two communities and boldly suggest whether this is a topic about which we should be optimistic or pessimistic. And uh, as Dwight said, uh, this is, I hope, uh, a contribution to the study of the subject up until around about the year 2000 uh, when it was published. And uh, a number of folks have said to me, well, you know, 20 years is a long time. Uh, isn't it time now for a, a second edition? So I'm trying it out on you. Uh, grateful for you being willing to be tried out on. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure to try it out on a North of England audience. I've tried it out on a Scottish audience. I've tried it out on a South of England audience. It's nice to fill the gap uh, in the middle. And it's very nice to do so in the context of the Drysdale Lecture Series, which, uh, as Trevor has just reminded us, was established in 1998, reflection on key areas in contemporary missiology. And I looked through the list, and there, there were several that are obviously highly germane to my topic this evening, uh, including the very first one by Martin Goldsmith in 1998, reflection on Christian attitudes to other faiths, uh, and then a couple on Africa, uh, a couple on Asia, uh, one on theological education in 2008, uh, and a couple on Islam, uh, Patrick Sugdeo in 2002, reflecting on the events of the previous year, which I, of course, will also be <coughs> referring to. Uh, and then Philip Lewis, uh, my good friend Philip Lewis, uh, just, uh, what, five years ago now. And it's also very nice to be able to do this in the College of the Nazarene, because, as many of you will know, uh, in the Qur'an, one of the words which is used for Christians is al-Nasar, which is commonly translated as Nazarenes. So Christians in the Qur'an as Nazarenes. What is the significance of this? Well, there is a very famous verse in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 82, that says you will find the nearest in affection to the believers to be those who say we are Nasara. Nazarenes. Interesting. It's part of the picture, of course, because the identity of these Nasara is not necessarily 100% clear, because that same chapter of the Quran has a couple of other rather challenging verses. They are unbelievers who say that God is the third of three. And then towards the end of the chapter, Jesus, did you say to humankind, take me and my mother as gods? This rather puzzling suggestion that Christians worship three gods, God, the Father, if you like, though that word, of course, would not be used in the Quran, Jesus and Mary. Is this what the Nasara of that time believed? Well, I'm fairly confident that's not what's being taught in Nazarene Theological College today, but it gives a certain relevance to discussing this topic here. And uh, I was interested to learn about uh, John Douglas Drysdale. Uh, there is the rather intriguing parallel between two Merseyside missions. Uh, Trevor was saying that uh, Drysdale moved down to Birkenhead from Scotland uh, as an evangelist, settled in Birkenhead in 1916. Emmanuel Church, Emmanuel Bible College is his legacy. And just literally three decades prior to that, uh, another mission was established uh, in Liverpool uh, by the rather intriguing figure of William Henry Quilliam, 
who was a convert to Islam, uh, took the name Abdullah and established the Liverpool Muslim Institute, first functioning mosque uh, in the UK. Now, Quilliam's life story was a little bit complicated. There's kind of diplomatic dimension to it that makes his legacy a little bit contentious. Uh, and partly for that reason, uh, the institute closed uh, after his death in 1908. But there is now an Abdullah Quilliam Society that was established in 1996 and is endeavouring to restore the mosque on Brougham uh, Terrace, that first mosque. And then there's also, of course, this delightful connection between Manchester uh, and Liverpool. I was very interested, as I walked here from East Didsbury Railway Station earlier on this afternoon, to pass the blue plaque which commemorates Daniel Adamson, the originator of the idea of the Manchester Ship Canal, a fairly formidable piece of engineering. And uh, I tried to find uh, a copy of this cartoon in Punch uh, from 1882, which uh, coined the phrase Manchester sur mer uh, under the awful caption, a seductive title. Uh, but um, that era, Birkenhead, Liverpool, of course, the era of emigration, when these huge numbers of people passed through the port on the way to the United States, about 9 million, it's estimated, between 1830 and 1930. And that connection between Manchester and Liverpool, I guess, is an ongoing one. Uh, Manchester by the Sea, of course, the film uh, which appeared in 2016. I don't know whether I'm the only person who thought that it was going to be about Liverpool, but it is, of course, not about Liverpool because it was all set in uh, Massachusetts. Anyway, to our main topic, the current state of Christian-Muslim relations. What I want to do is to take you through four main uh, subject areas. Uh, apologies if this is all very familiar, but uh, geography is important, demography is important, uh, history is important. We're going to look at some classical history uh, and then some contemporary history, the events, in other words, uh, of the past two decades. Uh, and there will then, uh, of course, be some evaluation. So, some statistics and some geography. <clears throat> this is well known to specialists, but not necessarily so well known uh, otherwise. Here is the cake, uh, pie chart rather, from www.adherence.com. Uh, some years ago now, uh, representing the proportion of hu humanity belonging to different religious traditions. And the figures that they come up with are that in round figures about one in three of the world's population is in some sense Christian, and then somewhere between a fifth and a quarter is in some sense Muslim. And the significance of that, of course, is that between them, that means that over half of humanity is, in some sense, either Christian or Muslim. And here are the 10 countries in the world with the largest Muslim populations. Uh, Indonesia uh, at the top, uh, and then the three South Asian giants, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. Uh, only with number five do we get to the Middle East. Uh, and then Africa, Nigeria, is in there very importantly at number six. So we are thinking uh, of all the continents of the world. And here is a map that, uh, broadly speaking, represents that. Uh, the darker the shade of green, the higher the Muslim population. Darkest green is over 90%. Uh, the next shade is 80% uh, uh, and so on. And uh, here is another chart representing, in a sense, the same uh, information, this time with the size of the pie representing the, uh, the large uh, nature of the community. And uh, it is Indonesia, which is the largest uh, single Muslim population. 
population. And uh, here's another map, broadly speaking, that represents the same, uh, with the significant dot in the middle uh, of the slide uh, indicating that demographically the centre of the Islamic world is probably near the city of Lahore in Pakistan, not in the Middle East, in other words, but significantly further east. In round figures, about one in five of the world's Muslims then live in minority situations. Uh, that is often forgotten uh, as well. And here are the largest minorities by some very considerable way. Uh, India, uh, the third largest population uh, of any uh, country of the world, even if it's only about 10% of the population. Uh, and then well-known communities uh, in Africa, in Asia. China, of course, has been in the news because of the so-called re-education program, which many <coughs> Muslims in the west of China are currently having to undergo. Uh, and then there are countries there in uh, Africa and, of course, Europe as well. So here is what I think is the world's most northerly mosque, which is in Uppsala uh, in Sweden. And here is what was, until recently, the UK's uh, most northerly mosque uh, in Inverness. Uh, and this caused a certain amount of uh, light relief when it was reported uh, in the local press in Scotland that this was the green mosque, the ecologically orientated mosque, uh, because the previous use of the building had been as the Rangers football club supporters club and you don't have to know a lot about Scottish history to know that green is not the colour of Rangers football uh, there's now though having said that a mosque in the Outer Hebrides a Stornoway mosque uh, in the last year or so and uh, that is actually further north now there is of course the obvious question of definition in what sense are people Muslim? In what sense are people Christian? And here is somebody who I guess will be remembered locally uh, because of his time in Edinburgh, uh, sorry, in Manchester uh, up until two or three years ago with this interesting phrase, je suis musulman, non pratiquant, forgive my French accent, Muslim, but not practicing, not practicing but nevertheless still wishing to continue to affirm a uh, Muslim identity. And there are a couple of other uh, analogies. Uh, those of you who like Graham Greene novels uh, may remember this one. Uh, he was Catholic in the sense that the church he currently did not attend was Catholic. And the phrase of Jonathan Miller, uh, the theatre director, theatre producer, two kinds of Jews, those who go to synagogue and those who are Jew-ish. So in what sense uh, do people affirm their identity? And it's for this reason that we have these apparently paradoxical, rather puzzling phrases in some cases, the secular Muslim, the cultural Muslim, the heritage Muslim, even the ex-Muslim, but in some cases even then still affirming one sense and uh, here is a chart of different countries of Europe which uh, demonstrates respondents who while still claiming a religious label never uh, affirm that or never demonstrate that in terms of attending uh, acts of worship and Britain is up there uh, as number three uh, in that chart There's also then, of course, considerable diversity within uh, communities. And uh, here is a map which I hope you can see the detail with particular reference to diversity within the world's Muslim communities. And uh, different parts of the Muslim world have different coloured uh, dots uh, in them, which illustrate, for example, belonging to different law schools uh, within the world of Islam. So, 
diversity within the world's Muslim community. And putting out all that together, here is a demonstration in one single map which attempts to demonstrate the worldwide presence of Christian uh, and Muslim communities today. So the purple uh, is uh, the Christian uh, population. Again, the darker the purple, the higher the percentage of population. Uh, and it is clear that Christianity is a global religion which has lost, uh, to a very large extent, its presence in its original heartland. And not lost completely, of course, but uh, the religion of the Middle, Middle East is uh, overwhelmingly today Muslim. That's the geography, that's the tour, if you like. Let me now remind you of some of the statistics. And I'm going to concentrate on the UK uh, here. Uh, and um, given that uh, it is the Islamic tradition, Islamic community, which is very much at the heart of our thinking tonight, uh, I've highlighted these figures uh, for you in green. And these figures, of course, are not absolutely right up to date. They come from the census which was carried out in 2011. So a lot of thinking is going to be taking place in the next year or so about the role of religion in the 2021 uh, census. But 2011 population of the UK as a whole, 4.5% Muslim, almost 60% Christian. Scotland uh, is significantly different, and for all sorts of historical, social, and indeed economic reasons, it is the Muslim population of England which is the highest, just over 5% of the population of England in 2011 uh, was Muslim. Scotland, by contrast, just 1.4%, and the reasons for that are uh, interesting. London as you might expect, represents what human geographers now sometimes call super diversity, not just diversity any longer, in other words, but super diversity. And here we have, even in 2011, uh, over a million Muslims in London, 12.4% uh, of the population. And uh, some of the areas of London, particularly in the east side, very high indeed, 34.5%, 32%. I'm sure everybody who's involved in practical theology will know this, but here are the figures for Manchester. Uh, anyway, first of all, the figures for Greater Manchester, and uh, here, uh, Muslim population, just under 10%, uh, just under uh, a quarter of uh, a million. And then in the city, Manchester, uh, significantly higher figure, uh, almost 16%. Uh, and as I say, that will almost certainly have risen uh, over the course of the past few years. Muslim diversity is very important in the UK as well. And going back uh, 10 years or so now, there were these very interesting reports produced by the Change uh, Institute for what was then the Department of Communities and Local Government about each of the 13 main ethnic national groups uh, within Britain's Muslim communities. They've now been archived, but they are still accessible and still make a very interesting reading. And uh, here they are, the different groups uh, in alphabetical order and the particular parts of the country in which they are most present, with London, obviously, as might be expected, uh, by far the major uh, element. Note that Pakistani community uh, is about one in three of the population, uh, Muslim population, Now put all that together and what I want to suggest is that the relationship between Christians and Muslims 
has many different dimensions. And uh, anybody who has ever read the work of Professor Ninian Smart in the University of Lancaster uh, may well remember these the, the dimensions that he suggested form an essential part, really, of any religious tradition in the world, theological, philosophical, historical, social, political, and cultural. Each element, one element of any uh, religious tradition. And uh, as the book went through other editions, other dimensions tended to be added. So here are some more uh, statistical, psychological, economic, uh, and so on. When we think about uh, Christian-Muslim relations in particular, uh, what I want to suggest to you is that these three, which are related, but nevertheless distinctive, need to be kept in mind. Christian-Muslim relations can refer primarily to interfaith dialogue. So to give one recent example, if Pope Francis meets the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, as he did recently in the United Arab Emirates, that's pretty unambiguously interfaith dialogue. Religious leader meets religious leader. Alongside that, there is what we can call intercultural relations. And the relationship between religion and culture is, of course, a hotly debated, uh, hotly contested one. But an organisation like the British Council, I would suggest, specialises in intercultural relations. And that may have a religious dimension, but it's not primarily a faith question. And then, most obviously, uh, most controversially in some cases, there is also, of course, the matter of politics, international relations. And so if the leaders of the European Union, including the Prime Minister of the UK, uh, as they are, at, at, as we speak, meeting the representatives of the Arab League in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh uh, in Egypt, that's the traditional concern of diplomacy, international and these three things are not completely separate, but they are nevertheless, I suggest, distinctive. And it may be helpful to keep that in mind as we look at Christian-Muslim relations from a more historical perspective. Dwight kindly referred to this book, uh, and here is the top half of the cover. The picture from the Houses of Parliament in Westminster that shows one of what the architects of the Houses of Parliament 100 years ago at least thought were the eight formative moments of English and then British history. Richard I heads off on crusade. History. And uh, if you are uh, so minded, you can present the relationship between Christians and Muslims uh, in history in the form of a series of battles. And here are some of the conflicts which have taken place over the centuries in the first five or so centuries of the relationship between Christians and Muslims. And these are battles in the Middle East, Syria, Jerusalem, but then also in Spain and in France, also in what's now Turkey, and again in Spain. And here is a French picture of that battle in the year 732, the Battle of Tours, the Battle of Poitiers, when Edward Gibbon, the famous historian, suggested that if that had gone the other way, it would have been the Quran which was studied in the University of Oxford and not the Bible. So a lot depended on the outcome of that conflict. Jumping ahead to what we can call the Middle Period, again, another series of battles. The Crusades, the conquest of Jerusalem, 
the Muslim recovery of the city of Jerusalem. But then more battles in southeastern Europe and battles in Spain uh, again. The ebb and flow on the battlefield goes backwards and forwards. And the Battle of Lepanto in 1571 was the largest naval battle in history up until that time, only surpassed in some of the battles of the First World War. And here now is the preaching of the Crusade uh, again uh, in the year 1095. And then if we move on to the more contemporary period, again, we can present the relationship in military terms if we wish to do so. And here we are, of course, into the era of European imperialism, the different European powers expanding their control of different parts of the world, in India and in the Middle East. But then, most recently, a couple of battles again, once more, in Europe, in southeastern Europe. And here is a picture of General Allenby walking into Jerusalem in 1917, British conquest of the city, walking because he was a pious believer himself and he said he wouldn't ride into Jerusalem in the allies of Jesus' entry to Jerusalem many centuries previously. And here is the equivalent for French imperialism, the French entry uh, into Damascus. And uh, again, historians will have different views on this. But here's one suggestion from the BBC History magazine, uh, 2013. Ten key moments in the history of the relationship between Britain and the world of Islam. And there are quite a lot of battles in there, for better, for worse. Only probably number five, which is an educational one, uh, is different. And uh, again, round about the same time, uh, BBC History magazine, 20 battles that shaped Britain and eight, uh, including the delightfully named Armageddon in 1918 in what's now Israel-Palestine, involved the world of Islam. So clashes and battles can be seen as dominant. And it was this, of course, that gave rise to this famous book by the Harvard political scientist, Samuel Huntington, The Clash of Civilizations. The argument that the cultures of the world are essentially in a relationship of confrontation or conflict. But there is another side to the picture and that's represented by the other picture on the cover of the book, jumping ahead to the 17th century when British commercial expansion in India was just beginning. The embassy of Sir Thomas Rowe to the court of Ajmer in India. Opening of commerce and trade uh, and uh, an ethos, therefore, of exchange and if we look at history again, we can see many interesting examples of exchanges between the Christian and the Muslim worlds. And here is an interesting illustration of that. The head of the School of Philosophy in Baghdad, probably the leading intellectual institution of the day, if we go back a thousand years, and the headship of that school passed from a Christian to a Muslim and back to a Christian. And here is a famous quotation from an early Islamic philosopher suggesting that we Muslims should not be ashamed to acknowledge truth and to assimilate it from whatever source it comes to us. Even if it comes from before the coming of Islam even if it comes from 
and foreign peoples who are not Muslim. And uh, on the other side of the coin then, if you like, in Christian Spain, uh, here is the tomb of King Ferdinand III of Castile uh, in Seville Cathedral. And this is a tomb which is interesting because there are inscriptions in Castilian, in Latin, in Hebrew, and in Arabic, all praising the merits and achievements of the king. So the era of convivencia, the era of coexistence and positive uh, interchange. And Thomas Aquinas, the leading philosophic, philosophical theologian of the Middle Ages, has this interesting quotation where he quotes Aristotle, and he also quotes Avicenna, neither, of course, Christian, but still, in his view, valid bearers uh, of truth. And this is another famous picture in the history uh, of Western art, uh, Raphael's School of Athens, and again, there, yes, somewhere over here, is Ibn Rushd, the Islamic philosopher, alongside the great masters uh, of ancient Greece. One or two others, which we can go through fairly quickly, a painting of Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II by a Venetian artist. A Baroque mosque in Istanbul. Sounds rather counterintuitive, but true. The dome of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And around the dome are listed the 12 cultures which have contributed to American civilization. And there, number five is Islam. Positive exchange. And alongside Huntington, here is the very interesting book by another American professor, this time of Islamic history, Richard Bullitt, The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization. We often hear about Judeo-Christian civilization. His suggestion is that over the course of the years, we should perhaps think also of Islamo-Christian civilization. So classical history teaches us different things. You can have a model of confrontation. You can follow Professor Huntingdon. You can have a model of exchange. And you can follow Professor Bullitt. What about the 21st century? And what I want to do is to suggest that, of course, being selective, there are a number of incidents in the course of the last 20 years which seem to demonstrate the attitude of confrontation, even of conflict. But then there are also other examples which illustrate the ethos of exchange and uh, collaboration. And I'll begin with the more negative, the more pessimistic ones. And some of these, of course, I'm not sure I need to say very much about because they will have been widely reported. But here, right at the start of the 21st century, is, of course, the event from which many others followed. 11th of September 2001, planes flying into buildings in the United States, resulting in some 3,000 A couple of years later, partly a consequence of that, but not only uh, a consequence of that, the invasion of Iraq involving the UK as well as the United States. Severe dislocation in Iraqi society, severe consequences, among other things, for the Christian population uh, of Iraq. But again, confrontation 
in a military sense. Moving to Europe, 2004, again, not sure whether this will be widely remembered, but the murder of the Dutch film producer Theo van Gogh on the streets, I think, of Amsterdam by a young Dutch Moroccan Muslim. And uh, the rationale that he gave for his act was uh, disrespect for the Quran, whose text Theo van Gogh had used, or some of whose verses Theo van Gogh had used, particularly some of the verses which seem to be quite negative in their attitude towards women, projected onto the body of a naked woman in a film called Submission. And you don't have to have a lot of imagination to see how, in a sense, provocative that was. But uh, an individual act uh, of confrontation. Closer to home then, in the following year, the bombings in London for young British Muslims from Beeston, a suburb of Leeds, travelled to London to detonate their bombs on the London Underground, and some 50 people were killed uh, in that incident. <coughs> Same year, and back into the domain of culture, the cartoons which were produced in Scandinavia, uh, originally actually in Norway, uh, in a Christian uh, magazine, but then very quickly picked up by a secular Danish magazine, uh, Highlands Posten, uh, and one cartoon causing particular controversy, a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb in his turban. Again, provocative cartoonish uh, sort of way. Following year, and much more specifically theological, much more explicitly religious here, uh, the lecture given by Pope Benedict at his own old university, the University of Regensburg uh, in uh, South Germany, uh, in which uh, he quoted some sentences from a Byzantine emperor of the late medieval period seeming to suggest that Islam tolerated and accepted violence in the process of spreading uh, its message. Uh, and again, there are questions of translation, there are questions of interpretation, but widespread anger, widespread controversy uh, in different parts of the Muslim world. And closer to home again in the following year, a uh, figure well known, of course, on the British scene, Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, giving a lecture on Sharia, on Islamic law, at the Temple uh, in London, uh, and in a radio interview uh, very shortly beforehand, uh, suggesting that the uh, Sharia was, I think he actually used the word, inevitably going to become part of English law uh, in the years ahead. And Sharia is one of those words which is not always understood very accurately, is not always presented very carefully. Uh, howls of anguish from different quarters uh, resulted. 2010, back to the United States, another act of great provocation. Pentecostal pastor, Pastor Cherry Jones threatens to burn a copy of the Quran. And book burning, of course, is a, an act which has profound symbolic uh, significance on all sorts of levels. And uh, evangelical Christians in the United States begged him not to. Pretty much everybody in the United States begged him not to. But uh, it didn't stop him doing it. And then uh, following year, 2011, uh, the Minister for Minorities in Pakistan, uh, a Roman Catholic Christian, Shabazz Bhatti, was assassinated, murdered by his...
Oh dear God. Back to France, back to Europe, back to the cultural domain, more cartoons, Charlie Hebdo, the private eye of Francophone Europe. Again, cartoons interpreted as being disrespectful, leading to the murder uh, of a young French Moroccan policeman uh, outside the offices of Charlie Hebdo. And that very interesting conversation between the French Moroccan murderer and the French Moroccan policeman, a conversation which took place, I'm assured, in French uh, and not uh, in Arabic. And then the Christians in the Middle East and attacks upon them in recent years by ISIL and other Islamist groups. Uh, this rather melodramatic Guardian headline, uh, these may be the last Christians of the Middle East. It depends very much, of course, where you are, that different parts of the Middle East have had very different uh, attitudes to this, with some countries such as Jordan opening their doors to Christian refugees from other parts of the Middle East, uh, even uh, allowed to enter without uh, papers. And then here is the obvious local incident, which uh, I don't need to remind you of, I'm sure. Manchester Arena attack uh, almost, what, two years ago now. And 23 people killed by a young man from, I understand, the local, one of the local mosques uh, here in Didsbury. It's gone very quiet because this is all sobering stuff. But let me now put the other side uh, of the picture, some more positive uh, developments. And uh, here from the year 2000 uh, is an initiative which actually came from the then president of Iran, uh, President uh, Mohammed Khatami, the dialogue of civilizations, quite explicitly a riposte to the arguments of Professor Huntington with his phrases about the clash of civilizations. And here is the Xi president of Iran calling for a dialogue of civilizations. A year later, the start of a series of Christian and Muslim scholarly gatherings, the Building Bridges Seminar, which has met annually uh, ever since it was first set up in 2002, a gathering of scholars of scriptures, biblical and Quranic, to discuss particular significant themes together and learn not only about the texts themselves, but also about their interpretation. The World Economic Forum, in uh, the following year, or the year after 2004, set up this group of 100 uh, as an attempt from the more economic, the business perspective, uh, if you like, to promote uh, conversation. And again, it was the former Archbishop of Canterbury, then George Carey, who was the Christian co-convener of that group. Back in the UK, the Christian Muslim Forum was established in 2004, very definitely with the purpose of engagement, conversation, particularly for young Christians and young Muslims, addressing the issues faced by them in the context of the UK uh, together. And uh, it was a Methodist layman, Julian Bond, who was the first director to put this in, given where I come from. Uh, the idea of an interfaith week uh, came originally from Scotland in 2004, and that's been widely taken up uh, in different parts of the world uh, as well. 2005, the Alliance of Civilizations, this time uh, a joint venture of the political leaders of Spain and Turkey, both countries 
which in the course of their history have seen examples of confrontation, but also examples of much more positive uh, interaction. And then right at the other end of the world, 2006, this very interesting development in Indonesia, the establishment in Yogyakarta of the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies. Four universities, one Islamic, one secular, one Protestant, and one Catholic, collaborating in the teaching of religion. Uh, and that's had its moments, it's had its ups and downs over the course of the subsequent decade. That's uh, a very creative uh, initiative. And back to the Middle East again, 2007, uh, a common word, very creative, very interesting response to Pope Benedict's lecture uh, in Regensburg by 138 Muslim scholars from around the world, building on the Quranic phrase, calling on Christians to come to a common word, a discussion together. And it's very nice to see Dr. Yazid Saeed here, who is the editor of this very interesting volume, which commemorates the 10th anniversary of that uh, publication, The Future of Interfaith Dialogue, Muslim Christian Resources Through uh, a Common Word. 2010, the United Nations, uh, under the influence, again, of Prince Ghazi of Jordan, established its Interfaith Harmony Week. So people in Scotland like to say we're Scotland led, everybody else followed. Not for the first time and I'm sure not for the last. 2012 to 13, publication of a very interesting couple of volumes of Muslim thinking about other religions, Muslim theologies and the work of the author and editor of these books, Mohammed Hassan Khalil, is an extremely interesting, creative attempt to revive constructive Muslim thinking about other religious traditions. And then from 2016, partly as a response to the actions of groups like ISIL uh, in the Middle East, the Marrakesh Declaration, on the rights of religious minorities in predominantly Muslim majority countries. And I see I can't spell predominantly, so I'm sorry about that. Um, a very uh, interesting uh, initiative. And then the revival of creative Muslim biblical studies. These two volumes which uh, have done a great deal to revive, if not establish, creative Muslim engagement with the biblical text, reading the Bible in Islamic context, in which Dr. Swanson uh, has a very interesting chapter on the importance of purity uh, in faith. Uh, and then, as of literally just a couple of months ago, an absolutely unique work, a Muslim commentary on the letter to the Galatians. And people say, the letter to the Galatians, why is this of interest to a Muslim? The answer, of course, is that it is an absolutely seminal text for Christianity as it developed in distinction to Judaism. And a Muslim commentary on that uh, is extremely uh, creative. And I gather Dr. Shabir Akhtar is going to be here in a couple of months' time. So if you have the opportunity to come and hear him, uh, I would recommend that uh, very highly. So there's the, the list. I put the positive on the left this time and the negative on the right. And if you like graphs, you could no doubt do a, a graph of, in some years, do things seem to be getting better? In some years, do things seem to be going downhill? We can discuss that later. The future, well, I'm not going to do crystal ball gazing. But let me just make the obvious point that you can have confrontation still. Here are some members of the Scottish Defence League protesting against the presence of Islam in Britain on the 10th anniversary uh, of 
11. Here is a Scottish Episcopal Church, by contrast, opening its doors to Muslims for prayer. Not the church hall, but the church with all its Christian symbols. And it gets quite cold in Aberdeen. <coughs> Not much room for the mosques. When members of the Muslim community were praying outside in January, the priest and the council of the Episcopal Church said that this is not right. It must come in. And uh, the Muslim community, a little bit to their surprise, said yes, despite the presence of some of the Christian symbols. And then again, just one or two snippets. Uh, I mentioned <laughs> Prince Ghazi of Jordan. Uh, Prince Hassan of Jordan uh, is uh, a well-known figure on the intercultural, interreligious scene, uh, emeritus president of Religions for Peace. Some of you may well know the Imam and the Pastor, film from Nigeria of a Christian and a Muslim leader renouncing interreligious violence and collaborating uh, in order to educate more positively. And in Pakistan, uh, we've had the case of Asya Bibi, the Christian imprisoned for blasphemy on the basis of false accusation. Uh, and here is the very recent judgment, very interesting reading by the Supreme Court in Pakistan, uh, taking the accusers of Asya Bibi on and saying false witness is equally condemned in the Quran, and uh, an interesting case study there. So three factors for the future. Uh, these matter. Uh, I think uh, theology is, of course, important. Uh, so too is history, uh, but so too is demography. That's the reason why I spent some time at the very start thinking about statistics. All of these things have an impact uh, on Christian-Muslim relations. And if we think theology for a minute, there are things on which Christians and Muslims agree. Here is my suggestion of five points of consensus where Christian and Muslim affirmations seem to be speaking the same language. But alongside that, there are, of course, points of difference. And again, uh, we can come back to that uh, later uh, if you would like to. But each community, I suggest, is diverse. There is a spectrum of thought in each community. Not completely surprisingly, therefore, different people will have different views of the extent of common ground between the two. Some, but is it a little? Is it a lot? Do the two spectrums overlap almost completely? Or do the two spectrums overlap uh, hardly uh, at all? Different views in both communities on that. And one suggestion I think I would make very clearly is that there are grounds for pessimism. There are also grounds for optimism. It depends where you are and uh, a combination of the two, uh, indeed, may be necessary. So in that sense, uh, it is, of course, uh, up to us. Whether we go for Professor Huntington or whether we go for Professor Bullitt. And both may, in a sense, of course, be right. This is a lecture on missiology. Drysdale Lecture, The Place of Mission, uh, in all of this. Uh, let me end by pointing you towards what I think, at least, is the very creative example still uh, of Kenneth Cragg, uh, whose work, The Call of the Minaret, was published uh, in 1956, the year of the Suez Campaign, uh, one of those military confrontations between Britain and others, uh, and Egypt uh, in particular. And I'm very pleased to see that Christopher Lamb's book uh, about Kenneth Craig is one of the ones that's on display outside. So please do uh, have a look uh, at that. 
but the call of the minaret is still readable, it's still useful, and here are the chapter headings from the book Minaret and Muslim, Minaret and Christian, these six themes which Kenneth Cragg thought were appropriate and relevant for Christians with regards uh, to uh, Islam. And there was a bit of change in the second edition. Uh, participation, hope, and faith. These are new words uh, that uh, come in. But the themes uh, are as relevant as ever, and they are as relevant in Manchester. There's the name of the young man who committed that bombing back in 2017 in other parts of the UK uh, as well, uh, and of course, globally. And uh, it's great that in different parts of the UK, Edinburgh, here in Manchester, in Birmingham, and in Oxford, there are centers for the study uh, of Christianity uh, and Islam. The study of texts and the study of communities. I don't want to embarrass them, but the texts and the communities, Dr. Swanson and Canon Rawlings, are both needed on this. That's one of the great strengths of the centre uh, here. So let me say best wishes for the work uh, of the centre uh, and end with that wonderful photograph uh, on your website from, I think, the Oldham is it the old advertiser uh, of the dome and the spire with the Peter Street in the background? In the snow, actually. In the snow, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.